Welcome back. It's time for lesson two. We're going to start with a little review of some modern physics. And uh, basically, there's just a couple of ideas I want you to think about. Now, we're going to discuss these in the class. So when you arrive at class, we'll have a conversation about it. But I wanted you to think about it a little bit before you got there. The first concept is, what is the idea of normalization? And why do we care about it? What's, what's important about it? What does it mean? And uh, we're going to hit this concept over and over throughout the semester. So it's important to, to get it straight in your head. The other question is, how does the momentum operator allow us to get information about the momentum associated with a particular wave function? So what is it the momentum operator does? Um, how does it work to, to allow us to get information? I'm going to touch on that in a minute, but also I want to have a conversation about that when you get to class. I'd like to talk a little bit about expectation values and what they mean. The first thing I want to say is, uh, well, expectation value is a terrible name. Whoever came up with it uh, had a really bad day as far as I'm concerned. But anyway, let's, let's talk about it. Let's say you rolled a six-sided die, capital N times. You just kept rolling a six-sided die over and over again. And, and capital N is a pretty big number, so that uh, I couldn't fit all the results on the top of the fraction here. But... Uh, but it's a capital N underneath. And uh, what we're calculating here is the so-called expectation value of the, uh, the result of the die. And what would we get? How would we do that? Um, we'd add up the results. That, in other words, we'd add up the value that we see on the top face of the die for every trial, and we'd divide by the number of trials. I want you to notice that Another way we could do that same calculation is to count the number of times the number 1 appears in the numerator and multiply that by 1. Then we could count the number of times that the number 2 appears in the numerator and multiply that by 2. So if, if 1 appeared 57 times, we'd, the first term in the, in the second line would be 57. And if 2 appeared, um, I don't know, 50 times, then we take 2 times 50 that would be 100. But of course, that would be what you get when you added up all those 52s. And if 3 appeared uh, 30 times, then we'd have 33s, which would be 90. So 3 times, times 30, and so on. You can see that the sum you get in the numerator is the same either way you compute it. And what you end up doing is dividing by n, <clears throat> the number of trials. Again, same, so it's obviously the same thing. But if you rewrite that a slightly different way so that you uh, break the terms out, the number of 1s divided by n, the number of 2s divided by n, the number of 3s divided by n, and so on, you'll notice that um, the number of 1s divided by the number of rolls is nothing other than the probability of rolling a 1. And the number of 2s divided by the number of rolls is nothing other than the probability of rolling a 2, in, in the limit that n is a very large number. So we're, we're going to assume that capital N here gets big, you know, I don't know, millions or billions or something, something large. And so we can think of the expectation value of the die as the probability of rolling a 1 times 1, plus the probability of rolling a 2 times 2, and so on. So that's, that's where that formula basically comes from. If we continue on that line of thought, you can see that... Uh, if you want to know the probability of some random variable x, forget about the dies now, let's just say we have a random variable x that can take on different values, x1, x2, x3, that we can compute the expectation value of that random variable as the probability of getting the value x1 times the value x1, plus the probability of getting a value x2 times that value, and so on. So you can see how this expectation value formula comes out of general considerations. Um, and this would be the correct formula for a discrete random variable, a random variable that can only take on certain definite values. But in this class, we're often going to be dealing with random variables that can take on a continuum of values, a continuous set, you know, anywhere between 0 and 12 or something. And in that case, instead of doing a sum of the probability times the value, we're going to have to do some kind of an integral of a probability density. So the idea is that there's a certain probability per meter 
that the particle can be found uh, around x equals zero meters and a different probability per meter that it can be found around x equals one meters and so on. In that case, the corresponding sort of analogous calculation would be an integral of probability density times the thing that uh, the value of the thing whose probability you're computing. So you can see the expectation value of x is the probability density at some value of x times x itself. But uh, in quantum mechanics, of course, to calculate probabilities, what we want to do is to compute the magnitude of the probability density, or the probability amplitude squared. So it's the squared probability amplitude takes the place of the probability or the probability density, depending on what kind of amplitude it is. So in a wave function terms, you know, probability density is going to be psi star psi. And the way we'd write out the expectation value of x is to take psi star times x times psi. Now, we stick the x in between the psi and the psi star for reasons that will become clear in a moment, but it's, uh, it's a tradition to do it that way, and it's a tradition that makes a difference when the thing whose expectation value we're computing uh, doesn't commute with the uh, position, in this case, the, the argument of the wave function. So this is where the momentum operator comes in. You guys are already familiar with the momentum operator from the reading. You know that it's uh, minus ih bar times the x derivative of the wave function. So the way you calculate the expectation value of the momentum is instead of sticking x in there, you stick in the probability of the momentum operator. <coughs> but you compute the expectation value in much the same way. Now we're going to be digging into this expression and why it turns out the way it does and, and how that really works uh, throughout the course. But I just wanted to write it out for you in this way so you can see where the formula comes from. Um, and you can kind of, maybe that'll help as a mnemonic for you to keep track of, of how it goes. All right, let's talk about the uh, quantum facts of life. There are a few of them that I wanted to just throw out there for you guys to sort of uh, have in the back of your minds as, you, as we're going through this material. One is that the energies of bound systems are quantized. So if I have a system where a particle is stuck in a certain region of space and it can't get out because it doesn't have enough energy, that's called a bound system. And bound systems in quantum mechanics have definite energies that they can take on and, and other energies are forbidden. We're going to see the mechanism for that and how that all works as the course goes on, but I just wanted to have it as something that you have been exposed to. Also, things that are classically waves, like electromagnetic waves, in quantum mechanics end up behaving like particles. So, for example, photons are, are so-called particles of light. They have particle behavior. Uh, we saw that last week with the two-slit experiment. Um, you could have things that have a wave character, but also a part particle character. Uh, classical particles, things that we normally think of as particles, also have wave characteristics. So, for example, electrons. And we saw that again last week, so that's uh, part of what we did last time. And there are some basic relationships that you need to uh, absorb and internalize so deeply that they just seem obvious. But uh, I want to go over those. One is that energy and frequency are basically the same thing. We're going to see that uh, wave functions that um, whose phase rotates with a definite frequency are wave functions of definite energy. So frequency and energy basically mean the same thing. Momentum and wavelength mean the same thing. So wave functions that have a definite wavelength also have a corresponding definite momentum and vice versa. And finally that uh, if you have observables that are not compatible with each other, so for example, momentum and position are not compatible, it means you can't measure them at the same time, there's an uncertainty relationship between them that says that the uncertainty in the one observable multiplied by the uncertainty in the incompatible observable uh, have a minimum possible value, and that minimum in this case, in the case of momentum and and uh, position turns out to be Planck's constant. So 
uh, I just wanted to throw those out there as points of conversation. If you have questions about those things, please make a note of it, bring them in to class, and we'll talk about it. Um, I'm going to show the interference demo again this time. I wanted to remind you of it and what it says. Um, some of the things that, uh, that it ought to bring to mind are that in quantum mechanics, the, the thing that waves, the, the waving thing, is a probability amplitude. And that the amplitudes for alternative possibilities need to be added together. So if the thing can go this way or it can go that way and wind up in the same final situation, those two amplitudes need to be added to get the amplitude to be in the final situation. Um, the probability of a measurement is the squared magnitude of the sum of the alternative possibilities, the sum of the amplitudes for any alternative ways of having that possibility, and then finally the sum of probabilities of all the possibilities. So that if you add the probabilities up for every possible way, um, those, those uh, probabilities have to add up to one. All right. So what are we going to be doing today? Today we're focusing on complex numbers. So the main objective for today is to understand, become one with the idea of a complex number and how you deal with them. The other is to use these complex numbers, um, which turn out to be the values we use for quantum mechanical amplitudes. Use those quantum mechanical amplitudes to compute probabilities. Okay. So here we go. Let's talk about complex numbers. Complex numbers have a real part and an imaginary part. There is a formula called the Euler formula that we're going to be using to represent complex numbers in the complex plane. Um, this will bring to mind a representation of complex numbers that are it's called the phasor representation. And uh, when you get to class, we'll have some complex clicker questions, no pun intended, literally. Um, and also some board work to, to sort of exercise these ideas. Okay, let's talk about the complex plane. Um, a complex number can be thought of as an arrow in the complex plane. The complex plane has a real direction and an imaginary direction. The real part of a complex number is the part that points in the real direction, and the uh, imaginary part is the part that points in the imaginary direction. So you can think a complex number is a lot like a vector, but we don't call it a vector because it doesn't point in real space. It points in the complex plane, so it's a phasor. It's called a phasor. So, and there is a formula to describe the phasory part of a complex number. It's the Euler formula. Now I'm 92% sure you guys have seen the Euler formula before, but just in case you haven't, I'll remind you how it goes. If you have a complex number with a magnitude of 1, its real part is uh, the cosine of the angle that the phasor makes with the real axis, and the imaginary part is the sine of the angle that the phasor makes with the real axis. Um, you can also imagine a, non, a, a general complex number that has um, a magnitude other than 1, it could be bigger than 1, and you can use that same Euler formula to figure out what the uh, general representation of an arbitrary complex number would be. And it goes something like this. The real part is going to be A times the cosine of theta. The imaginary part is going to be the amplitude of the complex number, or the size of the complex number, times the sine of theta. Now, in this class, our phasors are going to depend on time. So the way it boils down is this. The phase of an amplitude, a quantum mechanical amplitude, is going to advance in time with a frequency that depends on energy. So the idea is you uh, replace the angle theta with a time-dependent um, angle that increases linearly in time, and it ends up looking something like this. So as time goes on, the phasors we use in this class are going to spin or rotate with a frequency that depends on energy. How does it depend on energy? Well, it's the Einstein relation. Um, energy is going to be h bar times omega. So that's all there is to it. Now you're going to see a lot of these phasors spinning in this class, so I guess try to internalize that concept and get used to it. Okay, how do you add two complex numbers? 
Well, it's pretty darn easy. Basically, the, uh, the real parts add and the imaginary parts add. So if I have a complex number that's the sum of two complex numbers, um, I end up adding the real parts together, and that gives me the real part of the result. I add the imaginary parts together, that gives me the imaginary part of the result. And you can see that that's exactly the same way vectors add. So the answer is complex numbers add just like vectors do. You can think of two phasers adding together exactly the same way two vectors might add together in two dimensions. What about multiplication? How do two complex numbers multiply? Well, it's, uh, it's different. <laughs> if I have a complex number, uh, 2 plus 3i, then you can work out the angle that the phasor for that number makes with the real axis, just the way you would a vector in Physics 110. And the length, the size of the phasor, is going to be worked out the same way using the Pythagorean theorem. And you can do that with another complex number, the b that we used from the previous example. Same idea. But when I multiply these two complex numbers together, um, the easiest way to do it is with the Euler formula. You simply multiply the two complex numbers together just like you would any other number, but notice that the phase angle is in the exponent, whereas the magnitude of the number shows up as a coefficient in front. So you multiply the magnitudes and add the phases. So you can see how these two particular numbers uh, multiply. Um, the negative 45 degrees of B partly cancels the plus uh, 56 degrees of A, and you end up with something like 11 degrees of phase when you're done, or 0.197 radians. But uh, you multiply the magnitudes and add the phases. That's how that works. All right, so when you come to class today, be prepared. I'm going to have some clickers for you. I'll have some board work to try these things out, and we'll calculate some quantum mechanical amplitudes and some quantum mechanical probabilities using these tools of complex numbers. All right, we'll see you guys there.